Welcome back, welcome back. One year ago this week, the Belgian TV channel RTBF caused uproar when it announced that the Flemish part of Belgium had declared independence and that Belgium itself was no more. It was, of course, a spoof intended to provoke debate. But one year on, it looks to some people as though the joke may be coming true. In June, Belgians went to the polls for a general election. Six months on, and the warring Flemish and French parties still can't agree on a government. And Flemish separatists are suggesting that a split is the only solution. Well, is it? A similar crisis 20 years ago was averted by the then Prime Minister, by the end of the crisis, when it was solved, Wilfried Martins. And he joins us now from Brussels. Mr. Martins, it's very good, very good to see you again. Yes, uh, good morning. Well, where is this crisis going to end? Yeah, we will have a government, but I cannot tell you in one month or in two weeks, six months after the elections of June, um, the political leaders of the different political parties are not yet able to come to a compromise, but they have to come to this uh, agreement. Uh, they will do it, but it can take time. And do you think that uh, Belgians should um, stay united in one country? Could, could the two separate countries, um, if it divided, could they both exist? Or would, in fact, the Walloon part of the country be, be too poor? This would be a disaster uh, for both for the French-speaking, but also for the Flemish. We are here in Brussels, we are in front of the building where the European Council is meeting now. We are in the center of, of uh, Europe, here in Brussels. And the only way for the future for the French-speaking, but also for the Flemish of Belgium, is to stay in a united federal country. So, and the enormous majority of the people also in Flanders, wants to stay in the same country, in Belgium. A recent opinion poll indicated that 90% of the Flemish people wants to maintain Belgium. How much intercourse is there between the French-speaking and the Dutch-speaking parts of Belgium? I mean, in growing up where you grew up, I mean, did you have lots of French-speaking friends or were they very separate? I am a Flemish. I was educated uh, in the Flemish culture. We are speaking the same language as the, as the Dutch, uh, the Dutch language. But I had, during my studies at the University of Louvain, and also in my work as a politician here in Brussels, I have a lot of contacts with French-speaking people. At school as well? Not at school. At school, I was in a Flemish school. But uh, I went to the university in Louvain in uh, 55. And then we had French-speaking and Flemish-speaking students in Louvain. Now the university is separated. There are two universities, the Flemish in Louvain and uh, the French-speaking university in uh, Ottigny, that's at 15 kilometers from Louvain. But you're confident, basically. You are confident that in 10 years' time, there will still be one Belgium. I am very confident. Uh, but we have a real political problem. And that political problem is that the actual political generation has to realize uh, compromises between the Flemish and the French-speaking people we did it during 30 years, and we always arrived at solutions. And the real problem today is that we have a new political generation. They are very concentrated on their region, but they have now to be conscious that they have to develop a common policy also for the whole country. Thank you for joining us. We, we hope to see you again soon, Mr. Martins. Greetings from here. Thank you very much. Next week, Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, will perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. 
The formal invitation from King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia seems to mark an improvement in the relations between Iran and its neighbors. The invitation came days after American intelligence had concluded after a wide-ranging survey that Iran had ended its nuclear program in 2003. But America's President George Bush still thinks Iran remains a danger. That doesn't seem to worry other countries like Saudi Arabia and Russia. So who is right about Iran's real intentions? Joining me right now, again, we're delighted to say, direct from Kahan is the Iranian journalist Nazanin Ansari. Nazanin, um, this finding, how much of a triumph is it for Iran as, as the president tries to, President of Iran tries to make out it is, and how much of it is, is, is fuzzy? It sounds as though it's a blow to the American position. Well, it certainly uh, has created a lot of confusion, not only in Iran, but also in the international community about uh, the Islamic Republic's real intentions. Certainly since the report has been published, there have been people and authorities who have been saying that the a nuclear weapons program is made up of three layers. And uh, the first layer being the fissile ma material, the second layer being uh, getting uh, the warheads, nuclear warheads, and the third layer being um, uh, having uh, uh, delivery, me uh, del delivery uh, methods such as uh, uh, rockets. Uh, as far as uh, the first one, uh, which is uh, about nuclear uh, uranium enrichment or creating plutonium, uh, Iran has been continuing with it enriching uh, uranium. Uh, the third one, having ballistic missile program, we have we know that they have been publicly showing off their Shahab missiles. So it remains with the second layer, which is creating nuclear warheads, and that is where apparently this report says that there there has been a stop. Uh, but whether now uh, there is a nuclear weapons program or not, this has created, the publication of this report has created an opportunity and an opening for uh, not only uh, Iran to probably come in and uh, engage with the international community be because it has eased certain tensions and the threat of uh, an attack. And this is where we are now. Between now and let's say March 2008, when there are parliamentary elections in Iran, what will happen? Will Iran be able to engage with the international community, abide by the U.S. Security Council resolutions, two of which have already been passed, and the third one, which uh, we are waiting to see whether it will be passed or not? So there is a window of opportunity, definitely. A window of opportunity, and who has to seize that opportunity? Which side? Iran or President Bush? Well, it seems to me that both sides have to seize this opportunity. And uh, we, we have seen uh, uh, from the United States, uh, there are murmurs and there, there, there have been um, statements made uh, as far as wanting to open up more dialogue. There is dialogue going on, for example, discussions in Iraq. Uh, and uh, also we see, uh, as uh, you mentioned yourself, Saudi Arabia has invited President Ahmadinejad to, to go uh, to Saudi Arabia for uh, the pilgrimage. There have also been openings from Egypt. S and uh, President Ahmadinejad also, uh, mm, uh, a couple of weeks ago, went uh, to a meeting of the GCC countries. So there is this mood of wanting to bring in Iran out from the cold. But whether uh, the regime in Tehran will want to abide by its uh, obligations uh, under the international treaties, that would be another question. Or the regime in America wanting to go ahead with Iran, getting closer to Iran, not sure whether it wants to or not. Well, thank you very much. In the new year, uh, there'll be lots more to talk about. The developments of Iran are on a weekly basis, so we hope to see you on a weekly basis thank as well. You. Thank you very much indeed, thank Nazanin. You. After the news, I'll be meeting the lead actor from the controversial new film, fascinating guy, The Kite Runner. That's after this short break.